So welcome everybody to the Intellectual Diversity Podcast. I'm John Tangney and my guest today is John Waters, who is an Irish journalist who has worked in Irish publications, including the uh, Hot Press magazine, uh, the Sunday Tribune, the Irish Times, and has written nine books, I think, including uh, Jiving at the Crossroads, Beyond Consolation, and the most recent one is called uh, Bring, give us back the bad roads. And uh, he's been a chronicler of Ireland's transition from a predominantly Catholic country to a, a liberal one over the past uh, 30 years. And one of the reasons I was interested in having you on the podcast was uh, because you've kind of been uh, at odds with the, the intellectual and cultural mainstream during the liberal era, I feel. And uh, I've been interested in my, myself in intellectuals who uh, operate as kind of outsiders. And once upon a time, you could count on all intellectuals to be outsiders. But Russell Jacobi wrote a book in, in 1987 called The Last Intellectuals, where he noted that uh, in the neoliberal era, it had become impossible for uh, intellectuals to operate outside the university system. And, and since the 1990s, really, um, intellectuals have become kind of domesticated and uh, institutionalized within academia, but you're somebody who's, to whom that hasn't happened. You've had an intellectual career outside of the academy, and you're, you're interesting as somebody who actually, I, I think, didn't go to university. Is that correct? Right, yeah. I was about to say that, John. Yeah. That's, that's probably a big factor. Yeah. You're dead right. I mean, um, not just uh, ac academia, I mean, but also... Artists, the arts, mm -hmm. um, yeah. the same thing applies. I mean, if you were to actually write down a list of the leading painters, poets, novelists, uh, short story writers in Ireland, uh, and ask them, they would all identify with the same set of issues now uh, on mm -hmm. the same side, for certain. Virtually, I would say, if you got one who dissented, it would be quite shocking to me. Uh -huh. uh, that's how monolithic the whole thing is. And, and uh, so I, I kind of have been outside those loops all my life, really. Um, I was outside the journalistic loop uh, from the very start, even within Hot Press, because I came from the country and I was actually writing from the west of Ireland for Hot Press, mm. which was very much a neoliberal organ, you know, in all of its, in the, the visible parts of its ideology. Um, I mean, because it was about music predominantly, that was somewhat concealed and it was possible to actually, you know, continue writing for quite a while on that basis without showing your, you know, the, the color of your, the, sh the tail of your shirt, as it were, you know? And yeah. So I kind of did that, but I, I've kind of always been jockeying in this, I, this thing of trying to stay as long as possible in the media, mm -hmm. uh, while at the same time not abandoning my own kind of perception of things. And of course, now I failed. I mean, you call me a journalist. I'm not sure I am anymore because I left the Irish journalism about five years, four or five years ago, four years ago, I think. And uh, uh, I don't write for any Irish newspapers now. I don't appear on radio or television in Ireland. I have, even though at one time I was never off it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I write for uh, the American magazine First Things. Uh, um, I have been writing for them for the last couple of years. And I write occasionally for The Spectator as well, both the, mm -hmm. the American version and the UK version sometimes. So I, that's kind of just keeping my hand in, you know. And, and uh, I've, I've recently been doing quite a bit of uh, stuff like you're doing, you know, the, the, the podcast thing and, and, uh, and YouTube stuff and, uh, with, with various people. Not my own. I don't do my own, but I, I have various people that I do uh, interviews with periodically. And uh, so, but yeah, you're dead right. I mean, the, 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 the academia and the media and the arts are now, you know, uh, really monolithic in terms of ideologically, and a monolith, an ideological monolith. And, and uh, that's really, I think, goes back to the 1960s, that, that mm -hmm. those very attractive kind of cultural uh, tropes that, that, that arose in those, in those times, you know, the idea of being, you know, uh, in favour in general, of the greatest amount of freedom, mm -hmm. uh, put it very simplistically and, and simply, uh, that became very attractive. It was very attractive to me, actually. Yeah, yeah. It, still, it still is. You know what I mean? I, I, like this is not about. Uh, I don't think conservatism in the in the normal sense at all. 
It's not about progressivism and conservatism. It's actually about what fits and what works, both for the human person and for society. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've recently started describing myself again, somewhat mischievously, as a progressive in the C.S. Lewis sense. And C.S. Lewis uh -huh. said that, you know, when you're on the wrong path, everybody says you must have progressed. It's natural. But when you're on the wrong path, the natural, the proper thing to do is go back. Yeah. And find the point where you made the mistake, made the error, and trace your steps to there, and then go on again in a different direction. That's the kind of progressive I am. Uh, and I just think all the stuff that I'm kind of, we're dealing with now is just completely bonkers. Yeah. And, and it will be deeply damaging, not just to the human person within our civilization, but actually will ultimately dis disintegrate our dis civilization itself. Maybe, and when I say ultimately, that sounds like a long time. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be that long, to be honest, the way things are going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's an important point you raise about progressivism and and the way that it's been, that word has been co-opted by the left, as if conservatives traditionally have not been into progress. I mean, I think the difference in a way between conservatives and um, liberals is that liberals want to break with the past and expunge the past, whereas conservatives see themselves as making progress in continuity with the past. And uh, you know, John, John, Roger Scruton. Uh, so it describes conservatives as, as, as people who are interested in muddling through, whereas liberals have a more, and, and leftists have a more kind of uh, revolutionary energy, but they don't have any very coherent programs for uh, what they want to replace the things that they're tearing down with. I think, but that, I think that's bang on. And, and, and another way of putting that, or a way of kind of giving some kind of broader dimensions to that would be to say that the kind of progress, progressive that we have now is essentially like we all were when we were teenagers. Mm -hmm. You want freedom. You want yeah. the amount of freedom. And there's a number of things going on behind that desire. One is that you are re rebelling against your parents. You're rejecting mm -hmm. things. They, because you have the luxury, being young and being mm -hmm. still to a high degree dependent, perhaps, of simply rejecting their ideas. And it is part of the parents' responsibility, in a sense, to embrace that, to, to yeah. extend... Uh, in a certain sense, uh, you know, uh, freedom. Yeah. To, to like that, to let the, the, the child, let the teenager rip for those few years until they find their own, you know, uh, equilibrium culturally and, and personally and so on. And I think that what's actually happened is that, you know, basically we've, we've all become stunted in our culture. Mm -hmm. That we, you know, Robert Bly talked about this in his book, The Sibling Society, about 25 years ago, where he warned of this imminent uh, change in our culture whereby there would be no longer any adults. <laughs> we would have a, a society of siblings you know, tearing each other apart. Well, like, that's exactly what we have now. I mean, I, re I read that book in the early 90s and I thought, oh, this, uh, this sounds like, you know, uh, a dystopian fiction, you know, but it's actually now come true. We are that society, the sibling society. Yeah, and um, I, I remember reading in the past couple of years about leftist activists in Berlin and how many of them were, like it was something like 90% of them were people who were still living with their parents, even, you know, though they were in their 20s and at an age where most people are leaving the nest. And I think it does speak to the fact that um, there is an attitude on the left that people deserve to be given things without doing anything. And that's it, it, that one of the things that motivates a lot of the really resentful leftist activism is, I don't know, a, a kind of a projection of some kind of uh, deficiency that they feel about being uh, among society's net takers. And, you know, your analogy of the, the adolescent who's rebelling against the parents and the parents giving them scope to do that for a little while. But, of course, what's really happening there is that adolescents have freedom to do that because there is a... A kind of a liberal society within which that's permitted that is held up by the economic work that they're that, that the parents that they're rebelling against are actually doing and, and as you say this is something that's become generalized now even among people who are past that age and, and in fact you know you know we all have that sense no matter who we are that, that you know we can all be rebels mm -hmm. there is a stable structure yeah which to bounce the, our balls, as it were, you yeah, know, yeah. That's, that's the problem. I mean, you know, I remember Dylan Thomas years ago had a very um, sardonic uh, evaluation of, of this whole thing in a different, slightly different context. But he said the only, somewhat ironically and sardonically, he said the only uh, proper politics for a conscientious artist 
is left wing under a right wing government. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hadn't heard that before. Yeah, so, so that's, and that's it. You know, these people are all right. This is great, so long as you have some kind of, you know, tyrannical in your imagination yeah. structure, which is imposing itself on you. And, yeah. and that doesn't exist. What you do is you summon it up in your imagination. And that's why Trump has become so useful to these people now, again, because, I mean, you know, it's become fantastic. You know, uh, I read a, I, I, the headline in an article in the New Yorker this morning, and it was by a woman a writer who was saying how, you know, uh, it's, it's terrible that we can't wake up in, in, in the morning now with, under Trump and, and enjoy uh, a sense of freedom, mm -hmm. you know, anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, you know, the extraordinary thing is that actually the opposite is, is true almost, that the people who supported Trump have woken up like that for about 40 years yeah. under the tyranny of this pseudo-liberalism, yeah. imposing itself on them. And yeah. now they're getting a little bit of taste of what that might have felt like. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not nice um, to them. But you see, there are so many things one could say about all this, you know, that, that we're now in a, in a very weird uh, situation where in a sense, the people who are running the country and running the world are pretending not to be. Mm. They are pretending to be the opposition because that's their natural way yeah. of being. You think it's like the hippie thing. It's like the 60s in ethic of, you know, uh, being in, in a rock and roll band and, and you know, breaking your guitar. Yeah. You know, that's what you need to do if you're that kind of mentality. It's not congenial if you actually have power. And the problem is they actually have had power for a very long time while uh, pretending not to be in power at all. Mm -hmm. And so this has been deeply confusing for everybody, uh, not least the, the, uh, if you might say the, the, the spectators who are the, the voters and the consumers and the mm -hmm. citizens of our countries who are not sure any longer what the hell is going on because everybody is talking uh, in, 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 in fork, with forked tongues and, and mm -hmm. it's very difficult. The media, of course, being entirely on one side of this argument is now in terms of its own project, its own um, calling, its own vocation, uh, is corrupt. I mean, it is completely corrupted. So it is absolutely useless uh, in terms of the purpose for which it was intended. Yeah. And that's really a problem because it means none of us can actually have open conversations in the mainstream of our society any longer. It's not possible. And as a result of that, what you actually see is a you know, a stunting and a stultifying of, of the own ordinary everyday conversations and relationships between people in their communities, in their mm -hmm. villages, in their cafes, you know, that, that people who once would have had open conversations loudly across the floor of a bar or a cafe yeah. are now, you know, talking into their chests mm -hmm. uh, for fear that somebody may hear and that it will get around, that they have a view you know, for example, that, you know, this guy Trump might not be such a bad thing at all. You yeah. know, a lot of people have that view, but they're afraid of their lives to actually give any indication. I keep finding this out, actually, where I'm in a situation like that, maybe, and I'm one, uh, one was not long ago in a, in a kind of a service station down the country, in, in, uh, down near Longford, and, and uh, you know, an old guy who works there was kind of bantering with another guy who was stacking some bread on a shelf and mm -hmm. he, his name was actually, the guy who was stacking the shelf's name was John Lennon, you know, and uh, yeah. the old guy said, oh, John Waters and John Lennon in the same place, would you, would you have to leave it, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then he said, uh, all we need now is Trump to walk in and we've got three something, we've got a real, you know. Yeah. I said, uh, the guy said, oh, you the, the John Lennon character said, well, oh, no, no, uh, Trump, terrible, you know, whatever. And I said, oh, well, I don't know, you know, you know, when you think about it, maybe he's not such a bad guy. And eventually, within almost immediately, he started to turn, and it became clear actually that he actually liked Trump. Mm -hmm. I never yeah. said that before publicly. Okay. He was watching Trump and thinking, oh, this isn't this isn't so bad. And yeah. so, so this happens all the time. I mean, it, it's it's quite extraordinary uh, actually. Um, that that uh, our co this is something that because we don't have any commentary any longer by mm -hmm. definition, we're not aware of uh, culturally. Because if we have, if, if this, if you could imagine that the media was engaged, was not, the, and this is complicated, but if, if the media were not doing the job that they're doing and something else was doing it, 
then it will be telling us this is what's going on. Mm-hmm. This also will be saying, wow, look at what's happening in our society. We can't talk to each other anymore. Mm-hmm. There's certain things which are verboten, which are taboo, uh, and people are paralyzed for fear of actually crossing the lines. And, um, but because we, the media are the people who are supposed to tell us these things and allow us to say them to each other, nobody knows about them. So nobody knows what's happening. Each person is unaware that there's something happening to him or herself or herself or what the nature of that is. Maybe they have some feeling about it, but they're not giving it any conscious thought. And mm-hmm. people would be quite surprised if you were to point out to them, you know, and I often are, I say, you know, you are actually seriously circumscribed now in what you can say to me, even in the privacy of our table at, in the cafe. You're actually censoring yourself all the time. People are shocked when you say things like that to them, but it's happening all the time. Yeah, yeah no, you're right that um, the kind of left-right politics today are, are dividing friends and families and, and people are, are predicting, uh, you know, an oncoming civil war in America over this stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it does remind one in a way of... Uh, the, the post of post civil war Ireland and the ways in which families were uh, were yeah. were divided. I mean, do you think that's a fair yeah. analogy, uh, or is are these two very different circumstances? Given that one was happening in a kind of predominantly rural uh, theocratic society, and the well, other is happening in a postmodern society. I don't think it's actually uh, uh, extreme to suggest the possibility of civil war in different mm. countries, not just America, possibly in Britain as well. Mm. Well, it won't come up. It won't come about, in my opinion, because of precisely this. Just these tensions. I think that's not the trigger. The trigger will be the the reaction to these events by that establishment that I talked about that denies it is the establishment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, because actually, what we're already seeing is that these people, in the vast majority of cases, have no attachment to democracy at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can see that in the Brexit thing. Immediately, they lose their, their referendum and they want to just simply uh, rerun it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, lots of us have lost referendums and we have to just suck it up. You yeah. know, and, and, but they want to rerun it. And their, their whole me- media machine for like a year and a half goes about this, uh, you know, in, intensively arguing for this and trying to bring this about. And, um, in America, you have the same thing now with, with uh, Mueller and, and the attempt to basically take down the president. Mm-hmm. And I think, of course, if that happens, there could well be a civil war. If there were, that's, that. So it's because that these people have no longer any recognition of uh, democracy, uh, except mm-hmm. when it gives the answer they want, uh, that, uh, which isn't, of course, democracy at all, uh, mm-hmm. that... that that would be the trigger, I think, that basically we will have arrived clearly at a post-democratic mo- moment. And, you know, we already are in, in deep danger in other respects. The rule of law in lots of cases are, uh, in our societies is being suspended. You can see this now as well, the, the Me Too movement. Yeah. You know, that this is having a, a profound effect on the, you know, the belief system which underpinned our rule of law. Principles like uh, you know presumption of innocence, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, which were part of, of our civilization for for centuries, are mm-hmm. now basically cast aside. Um, and again, that wouldn't contribute. But is it, so it's you know the rhetoric. You see, this is a very interesting thing that if you actually what you said about civil war, you will pick that up in the mainstream media. They mean the diametric opposite. They mean this guy Trump will create a civil war yeah. because he's a psychopath. No, no, no. It's not Trump that will create the civil war. It's you trying to destroy Trump and deny the validity of his election. That is the problem. And the same goes for Brexit. So, and, and what we're seeing now right across Europe, uh, it's really amazing because, it, you know, again, it's, 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 well, I don't pay that close attention to the mainstream media anymore. Uh, but it doesn't seem to me that they're reporting what's actually going on in Europe at all, uh, very, uh, 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 you know, intensively, because, you know, France is burning. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Italy is, has fallen to mm-hmm. what they call populism. Yeah. Uh, 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 Matteo Salvini, uh, uh, Salvini is, is, is actually now basically, you know, almost like, you know, universally acclaimed in his country. He, yeah. 
uh, in Italy, having they spent, I mean, 10 years basically on the floor, economically, uh, psychologically, culturally. This is one of the greatest countries the world has ever seen. You know, Italy, yeah. phenomenal cultural powerhouse. And they were bro- reduced to, uh, to being a broken people by, yeah. the, by the European Union. And yeah. now they're rising again, and, and uh, Salvini is, is, is leading them. And, and, and now he's, this is, you know, uh, contagion is carrying this to other places, to Spain, like, which was, you know, 10 years ago, deeply left wing. And now you have Vox who are now like escalatingly, you know, increasing their, their support like overnight uh, uh, by leaps and bounds. And uh, Sweden, the same thing, the Sweden Democrats. And then, of course, Eastern Europe is pretty much, you know, rock solid. So in the end, I, I keep telling people the only place in, the, in Europe that will, that will not know about this will be Ireland, you know. You know, we, we still think, you know, Trump's terrible, Brexit's terrible, you know, all those populists all over the place, and the whole world will have changed and nobody will have told us. You know, that's kind of the way things are going because our media is utterly, equally, profoundly corrupt. So, so when you say that the, the, the media is corrupt and people don't know what's going on anymore, is, is, is that uh, more extreme in Ireland or is that not the, the case everywhere? I mean, there is a... A constituency, it seems to me, in America, in Britain, uh, and in other European countries as well as Ireland, that you know still kind of naively believes in the mainstream media. But there's this upsurge of alternative media sources that a lot of people are accessing through, you know, the things that are posted on their Facebook feeds and that are giving them uh, alternative views of the world. And and you know the, the the mainstream media has lost a lot of its credibility everywhere. Yeah. Um, and. I mean, you, you, you're somebody who worked in the mainstream media for a number of years and you worked for a, a newspaper that used to be known as the, the Irish Newspaper of Record, which suggest, suggested that it was some kind of neutral organ that was representing you know, the, 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 the spectrum of opinion within Ireland. And it, that clearly stopped being the case at some time in the past yeah. 20 years. And do you have a sense of when that stopped being the case, that the Irish Times was uh, something other than a, a, a partisan uh, liberal organ? Um, it's a very good question because I'd have to filter in there somewhere the possibility that I was actually missing things about mm-hmm. the nature of the paper, really. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it was never as kind of uh, uh, solid as I thought it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there was a time like 20 odd years ago when like the Irish Times was regarded with huge reverence. I found this mm-hmm. from going abroad, I mean, another journalist. Like they knew about the Irish Times, they read the Irish Times, mm-hmm. they thought it was one of the best newspapers in the world. Like that was really a kind of a, a thing back then, you know. And yeah. uh, when I came in, I was kind of slightly left leaning, you know, it was a soft, mm-hmm. just, you know, in this coming out of that 60s thing, I hadn't really thought any of this stuff through. And I then went through a number of experiences um, uh, where I uh, began to think through. What, had, what was going on, and, and mm-hmm. I, I talked about it. There were three fundamentally. One was that uh, because I became an alcoholic, mm-hmm. I, start, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and there w- was, you know, forced to look at the question of what is called God, let's say, mm-hmm. yeah. and in, in my life and so on. And, and that opened my eyes to something about myself that I had completely not understood, you know, just yeah. walking around the place, that actually, to put it like this, that, you know, this, my structure as a human person was when you actually thought about it in terms that had been generated or was being generated by something else in the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a created being, but I was still being created. That that actually tallied better with how I felt about myself mm-hmm. having it all my life and seeing this experience of alcoholism. It, it tallied much better than any other hypothesis that I'd ever come across. And I started to explore that and to ask myself, well, I've missed all this. So what else have I missed? And that was one of the key kind of awakenings for me. The other one was when I went to Prague after you know, the Velvet Revolution and started to report on that there. And I met some people there and uh, started to talk. And of course, I was bringing my soft leftist ideas there, which mm-hmm. was a very stupid thing to do. And I was having arguments with people. But there was one guy in particular, you know, who would, he had uh, got the job of, he had cleaned up candle wax from a shrine on the main on Narodny Street where the revolution had started, and he used to make these um, 
busts, his candle wax uh, uh, busts of the heads of Stalin and Lenin and a guy mm-hmm. called Kevin Gottwald, who was the Czech equivalent of those guys. And he made them quite big heads, you know, almost real life size, you know, and he, he, with wicks and everything. So you could light it, in, you know, uh, on your dinner table. And, uh, he thought this was a very funny thing because the, the Czechs have a very weird, you know, they call it absurdistan, you know. So he, mm-hmm. So he, and we were having all these arguments, but when we were when I was going home, he brought and we still hadn't resolved the arguments because I was basically saying, well, you know, socialism started off well intentioned and essentially it has that potential. That was kind of my position. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, as we were going to the airport, he had a box on his knees in the taxi. Mm-hmm. And at the airport, he handed me the box and opened the lids, and there was all these heads. And he says. Uh, these, these, these candle heads, and he said, uh, you must bring to Ireland the heads of the socialist murderers. And, and something about that statement just hit me in the sore plexus, you know, and, and, and uh, I thought, oh, this is, this is, no, I hadn't got this at all. I haven't, I haven't known this man. I haven't understood his experience. That phrase, now, I, I feel it. I don't mm-hmm. understand it completely, but I feel it. And that was another. And then the third one was when I, I had a daughter. Uh, uh, in, I was unmarried in, in 1996. She's now 22. And uh, I had written a play about fatherhood uh, mm-hmm. before, blindly, because I hadn't any direct experience of being a father. But I had been picking up from men around the place that, that there was a problem, that mm-hmm. a lot, particularly when marriage broke up or when there was no marriage in the first place. Mm-hmm. The father was treated as if he was extraneous to the whole process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he, Kind of go to court and seek to be given what was called contact with his own child, and yeah. you know, and, and you know, contact with your child. Access is another one. Actually. Access, yeah. access. You could access your child like this. Yeah. And these lawyers and judges poring over these statements and deciding whether the the man who was the blood, the flesh and blood of this child, would actually be allowed to see him or her. And so, when I did, that happened to me, and 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 and. Uh, I, you know, I, when I started to really feel it and experience it, I thought, well, you know, I come from left liberal position. I was mm-hmm. hot press, which is extremely aggressive in terms of these, uh, you know, human rights and so on. And I'd been editor of In Dublin, which was a, a, the, the national, the, the listings magazine at the capital city. And that was a very left leaning and very good magazine as well. And, um, and I'd been editor of Miguel, which was, again, a very uh, uh, left leaning. Uh, Current Affairs magazine, and uh, you know, a little mm-hmm. like spec- not no, a, a left wing spectator, if you like, you know, mm-hmm. the, you know, I think of an equivalent quality in terms of the writing, but somewhat left wing, and it's generally thus. And, and um, uh, I thought, well, you know, I'll just go back to my my uh, compadres, my my fellow mm-hmm. uh, activists and journalists, and you know, mm-hmm. it won't be long dealing with this problem of the denial of rights to fathers and their children and uh, yeah. but when I started to tell them they just wanted to shut me up you know mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, they'd be they spent 20 years so that's kind of a long way of coming to the point that I, I didn't start in the Irish Times to write about these issues and I found that the hostility in the Irish Times towards me was really like it was know, extraordinary yeah, yeah, yeah. Palpable. and you know there were clearly there were attempts uh, to actually have me removed mm-hmm. And serious people, like I was actually threatened on the street. I used to have a thing that I did actually. Whenever the editor would sidle up to me in the newsroom and start having a general conversation, as the the, the guards, the police used to call at one time, you know, when they were interrogating the suspects, yeah. we would first of all we had a general conversation, you know, and yeah. then I bed him up, you know, and then uh, uh, and uh, so. He would sort of, you know, news about, you know, was I happy as a columnist or. Yeah. Um, Maybe sometimes, you know, columnists might get stale, was, I think, an expression that would be used. Or, you know, but maybe we would sort of muse, you know, well, I must talk to you. I think you'd have a lot to, t- to talk to me about the way our television coverage, you know, I mean, I would have understood immediately what this meant, that he was going to transfer me as soon as possible yeah. to the TV yeah. page or something, you know. So, <laughs> so what I used to do then, I used to go straight home and mm-hmm. I would pull, pull, pull down my uh, John Stuart Mill uh, volume uh, on liberty and uh, that uh, he wrote and, and uh, about freedom and about uh, uh, freedom of speech in particular and, and the importance of it. And mm-hmm. So I would write another essay on uh, John Stuart Mill uh, and that would 
you know, and I would also in the course of it take the precaution of praising the Irish Times as mm -hmm. wonderful tradition of upholding mm -hmm. the values of free speech. Uh, and yeah. that was, and I managed to survive for years actually by just doing the same thing over and over again. And uh, uh, so, but, but, but it was pretty, I mean, increasingly because of all of these things, I was becoming more and more isolated when the Irish Times. I mean, I was totally isolated. I had two or three people that I wouldn't call them friends in the Irish Times, but they were kind of people that I could occasionally talk to. They would ring me up. Maybe they were just looking for gossip. Maybe yeah. they were lucky to see if they, maybe they were sent to uh, talk to me to find out if there was anything, any way in to getting shot at me or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, but I would, so immediately, I, I, from about the mid nineties, I became aware that this was not what it purported to be. Mm. There was some indications of that before when I was there, because I used to write about the countryside, about rural Ireland, about, and that was kind of frowned upon culturally, not corporately in the Irish Times, but culturally within it. Mm -hmm. Now it was being frowned upon corporately and, and culturally. And, and so I just continued doing that. And I, I wrote about men and fathers and, and male suicide and men's health and domestic violence and the lie about that and all the lies that feminists told about men and yeah. again and again. And, and, and uh, uh, it was pretty rocky ride, you know. And, and uh, then, of course, what happened was that I made up. I, I stored up a lot of negative uh, equity uh, in terms of my, my uh, the affection that would have been for me in the Irish Times, and, and uh, when eventually the LGBT crowd came after me in 2014, not because I had actually done anything, because as I keep saying to people, I was a draft dodger on the gay issue. You know, I, I was constantly ducking and diving because I didn't want it was this to me was so sordid. Yeah. I didn't get involved in it. Uh, yeah. Um, but they came after me anyway because I, I had been clearly a Catholic and that was enough. And yeah. one or two other factors as well. I had intervened in certain things which were not about homosexuality per se, but they involved homosexuals saying very weird things about pederasty and whatnot. And there was a couple of cases in Ireland that, you know, you could see these ambivalences in the artistic community too, interestingly, you know. Yeah. Uh, when one of their own was accused in one, on one occasion in relation to uh, in involvement with minors in a foreign country. Uh, and, you know, if that was a priest, we would all, of course, have been kicking the head off the priest and the yeah. church. Yeah. Now they wanted to kind of say, oh, no, it's not such a big deal. Yeah. Okay, you know, so I, I intervened in those things and started saying, well, no, if this was a priest, you'd be saying this. Yeah. So why don't you say this now? And, and all this went on, you know, and... and so I suppose to make a very long story short, uh, uh, I kind of came to see that, that the Irish Times had ceased to be, in any sense, a, a, a vehicle of truth, you know, a conduit of, of, of proper conversation about the society. Mm -hmm. uh, no longer serve that. As regards the alternative media, I mean, uh, on that, I've been a kind of a late convert. Not a, I don't know if I'm a convert, because I have, I have deep suspicions and here I am on the internet, but I have deep suspicions about the internet, you know, and yeah. I continue to have them, not necessarily because of the technology, not because of any particular element within it, but because of, of uh, certain factors. I mean, the, 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 and we can see now with the, the ascendancy of the corporations within mm -hmm. the internet, that this is a deeply sinister development, not just on the internet, but in reality in the world, you know, that these people have, are essentially totalitarian. Google. You mean the, the, the uh, Mark Zuckerbergs and the yeah. Steve Jobs? Yeah. And the, uh, Google, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, you know, all these, these entities are actually of the same mindset as the others, and they want to use the power they have to ensure, to bring about the final victory of these ideologies. And yeah. they don't need anything else. That's clear. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and I suppose on a more... Uh, uh, Micro level, I just think that you know the the, the Twitter is a, an abysmal you know uh, uh, platform. Uh, it's it's just disgusting. Uh, you know what it has actually shown us or or done. I'm not sure whether it's that it has shown us something about our society or done something to our society or maybe a mix of the two. But it's not a pretty sight. Uh, I mean that you actually have anonymous people. Uh, you have people basically changing their personalities when they go on there and becoming yeah. more rancid. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah you know, uh, 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 people that you would ever not want to meet. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, 
that that said, I mean, I now recognize that actually the only hope of salvation, ironically, is going to come via this, the internet and via yeah. platforms like yours, yeah. like yours, John. I mean, that there that gradually uh, an alternative is being built. Yeah. You know, and um, and of course, I've always known, I've always felt, well, like the technology itself, the internet itself is neutral. Yeah. It's what we, we've been doing with it. It's how it developed, how it le because we were uncritical about the way it developed in the early stages. We just grabbed mm. all these baubles mm. and, and, and sort of, you know, the, the smartphone, which is, a, again, a very deeply sinister. I'm, I'm actually in the throes now of actually having to contemplate whether, in fact, I should just abandon my smartphone completely because I yeah. the, the, you know, the way that the capacity to basically track you all the time, even when you have your phone, as I have now on, on airplane mode, they can still yeah. track. Yeah. Uh, they probably still can listen to what I'm saying. And, of course, we're, we're guaranteed that or we're promised or told that, that this doesn't, um, you know, that this, this doesn't go any further, that it's purely technological uh, monitoring. That it, yeah. uh, but, I mean... How do we know, and, and how long can we be guaranteed that that will last? I mean, as soon as it falls into the hands of uh, a more malign, if it hasn't already, yeah. more than it already is in uh, the hands of, then we're all in big trouble. And, and uh, it can be used for blackmail, it can be used for, for surveying people in the most intimate uh, realms of their lives. I mean, if you said to us, if you said to me or any person, any sentient person, 25 years ago, hey, you know, I'm going to make you a, a, a deal. I, I give you an instrument that will allow you to communicate in all kinds of ways, blah, 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 and I list them all out. Yeah. Uh, but the, the downside of it is that you will lose all your privacy and all your, your personal you know, right to protect your own data. And, and your, uh, you would have said, are you crazy? Are you absolutely crazy? But yeah. we're seduced by this. You know, and they, 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 as all of, this freedom, all of these freedoms do, do they, they, they appeal to our passions, to our instincts you know, to our sense of misplaced sense of freedom. And so we, we grasp them with both hands. And now we're in the situation where, like, it's quite sh shocking, both what they can know about us yeah. and, and, and our own kind of slight lazy indifference to the whole thing. Yeah. Well, these things become normalized slowly and we, 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 uh, we, we forget how, how uh, radically they've changed us. Although I will say that the great utility of things like Facebook for me as somebody who works in a predominantly liberal and left world like the academy um, and for people I would think who work in journalism is that it puts you in touch with allies that you would never meet in the ordinary course of events if you were just confined to your uh, your, your community and your geolocation. I, I, I would say that's probably true. Uh, <coughs> I, I've never done it uh, because yeah. I have this almost kind of puritanical objection to it and, yeah. and to Mark Zuckerberg's face. Yeah. You know, so I, I just couldn't bear to be involved in it. And, and similarly, Twitter. I yeah. remember a colleague of the Irish Times was on radio one time, and this is quite a long time ago, and Twitter was relatively new at the time, but he was on Twitter, and, and I said, well, I'm not on Twitter. And he said, it's shameful that you're not on Twitter. Yeah. I said, well, yeah, there are lots of shameful things in the world, but that's not one of them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, that's the kind of uh, ideological cover fire that was given to all this. Yeah. Blindly by, by people in, in, in positions of power and influence, like the media or, or in the arts, where people talked up these technologies without actually pointing out the downside. I mean, the, the, all of the, uh, there are several layers now of, of danger. And um, the ones we've talked about, you know, the risk to young people the abuse they're getting, suicides, all of that. But also the effect of the screen time on the human intelligence. Yeah, yeah. This is shocking. I mean, when you look into this, it's absolutely... We, we actually could be on the downslide of our civilization as a result of this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've even noticed in myself a, a sort of a, a loss in my ability to concentrate for long periods on books in the way that I once could yeah. because of my, my connection to the internet. Yeah, but yeah. You, you can retrain yourself, you know, I mean, yeah. I think I would really recommend to people that they maybe this year is a good idea to, okay, I'm not saying give up everything. I was thinking of getting a Nokia 2110, you know, you know, again, and just going really kind of, you know, yeah. uh, total Luddite, you know. Uh, yeah. um, uh, but uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. Uh, but what I do say to people is, 
you know, pick up a book or a magazine or a paper. No, no, don't read a newspaper, but you know, a good magazine. You know, yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, and uh, Spectator is pretty good, and there's a few, you know, uh, and and re and really force yourself to read for a few nights or whatever, and and yeah. and you'll find it get easier. It gets easier, and then you have a great sense that you're actually you remember what it was like to read. Yeah. And, yeah. And I mean, it, it is it, reading is a contemplative activity. It does kind of. Uh, center you and ground you in a way that's continually clicking on uh, uh, things that give you some kind of uh, addictive rush on the internet doesn't. Yeah. Um, I find like even say if I was to read an article, I, I read an article this morning from uh, Prospect uh, on my phone mm. about a, a guy who had been a judge in a, in, a, in a fiction competition and he was talking about you know how is it possible for a judge to objectively assess the value of these and it was a very interesting article you know but again if i was reading that in a magazine i would be quite relaxed mm. make a cup of tea I, I would sit back i would leave it down i would look out the window i would think about each passage of it or, mm. and i would take pause when i'm on my phone i'm kind of in an agitated state trying yeah. to find what is the essence of this article you know yeah. what 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 is it telling me yeah. What, are, what is the single, what are the three things I want to know out of this article so I can somehow put them somewhere? But of course, what actually happens on the internet, you tend not to put them anywhere because one of the things that was, uh, uh, there's a book called The Shallows, came out a few years ago. I remember, yeah, Nicholas Carr, wasn't it? Nicholas Carr, exactly. And he, one of the things he said was that the core problem with, the, with reading on screens is that we don't transfer things to our long-term memories mm. the way that we do if we're reading from, from a book or, or a magazine. And of course, therefore, you don't remember the thing. You think you'll remember what's in this article. I'm reading it, but I won't remember it tomorrow. Yeah. And um, so, whereas I have the magazine, and I, I know I can fold it. It's something about paper that is quite revolutionary in a way that, you know, no technology is. And I, I, I've said this numerous times to people, that if we actually had experienced all of this the other way around, yeah. we'd lived all our lives with screens and buttons and, and, and all that, knobs and and had acquired all our information in that way. And then somebody invented the newspaper. Yeah. We would think it was the most amazing thing we'd ever seen. Yeah. Really? I, you know, that you can actually fold it up and put it in your pocket and put it on. And if you're defrosting the fridge, you can, it's very useful. I call it newspapers now, I call them newspapers. You can, you can actually leave the newspaper down on the floor if you're defrosting your fridge and you can soak up all the water. Or if you're taking out the ashes from your fire, you can wet the paper and you know, wrap it, the, the ashes in them. I think they're extraordinarily useful things, newspapers. The yeah. trouble is nowadays there's nothing in them to read. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, I mean, this business of clicking on links, I mean, it's the latest form of consumer activity. And it, it, it brings me back to what you were saying about the revolutionaries of the late 60s and the kind of sense of freedom they had that was combined with a diminished sense of what it means to be human and that you somehow woke up to this in the 90s when you uh, went to AA and you... Um, you, you uh, embarked on some kind of spiritual program, something I'm familiar with because I did the same thing myself. Um, and uh, we were talking in that context about when it was that uh, the Irish Times kind of stopped being uh, representative of the broad spectrum of opinion in Ireland and became a, a, a partisan organ. And um, I, I wanted to talk to you about one of the really important episodes in the cultural history of the last 20 or 30 years in Ireland that you wrote a book in response to. And I think it was uh, your, your Irish Times colleague, Nuala Fuelon's death. Yes. And uh, she, she gave this really amazingly honest interview to Marion Finucane just before she died. Yes. And, you know, she was somebody who kind of came out of that, I, that, that, that late 60s generation of intellectuals uh, maybe she was a little bit younger than that, but she was somebody who was kind of, you know, formed by uh, the, the same uh, group of, I, I would say, secular thinkers that uh, most leftist academics in the 70s and 80s were formed by. And, you know, it was extraordinary that the kind of philosophy that, that they taught her didn't seem to prepare her for death in the way that, uh, you know, philosophy is supposed to, if you... If you, if you understand philosophy in the way that, say, Socrates did. I mean, well, yeah. classically, classically, philosophy was something that was supposed to uh, teach you how to die, and somehow the the intellectual equipment that these leftist intellectuals had did not teach them that. And and so her, her, uh, her despair before her death was really striking. And, you know, whether or not you believe in God, 
know, it was clear that, you know, the intellectual uh, resources that she had were just less effective in preparing her for that moment than, say, somebody like John Moriarty, who died around the same time, who faced his death with relative equanimity as yeah. somebody who had a lot of faith. Yes, well, I mean, I think that's all pretty much correct uh, as a way of describing it, John. Uh, with this kind of caveat that I, I, I would say there's also a possibility that part of what, at least a part of what was going on there, which is a part of what's going on with all, all mm. of it, is that she was torn between what she felt permitted to say mm. of her identity as this person, this, this yeah. icon of this ideology, mm. uh, and what she would have loved to say, mm. if only so as to hear herself say it, uh, you know, in that moment. That, that uh, you know, she couldn't recant. Mm -hmm. So she longed with all her heart to find the words to say something that would have given her comfort in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of what fascinated me, that, that she, if you looked at the line, between the lines, she was almost like hinting at things that she would have... Because she was that kind of person, actually, you know, that she was somebody who was very ideological in one sense, but then every so often she would break out and become this kind of extraordinarily normal person, this normal woman of Ireland, yeah. who, who was like your mother or your aunt. And I mean, I knew her relatively well in the sense that I, we were colleagues who constantly for a long time talked, mm. either on the phone or, or in person. We would meet in the, the newsroom and literally stand there, we'd stand there for three hours yeah. in the corridor or on the stairs talking, you know, and they're like yeah. one of those weird things. And so I kind of, but she had a way of kind of backing off things. Yeah. And, and, and if they got too close to that, that kind of um, nerve, which kind of alerted her to the problem that there might be if she was to kind of suddenly cross over that line. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are like that. I know lots of artists and writers. By definition, they would be like that, actually. Yeah. You know, because... You know, because to deal with the stuff they have to deal with, you have to face really real stuff. You yeah. know, it's not like journalism. It's not like, you know, uh, accountancy. It's not yeah. like architecture. If you're a writer, you have to go in there to the possibility of stuff. If you, if you read book, I mean, whatever, you know, you, you use the phrase, uh, whether you believe in God or not, and that's exactly right. But nevertheless, these are, these are words to describe something that needs to be plumbed, no matter what way you do it. You mm -hmm. can't not plumb it. If you don't plumb it, you're in big trouble. Yeah. This is the problem. And, yeah. and culture forbid you to plumb it. Yeah. And that's kind of what she was dealing with more than anything else, I think. That uh, she was this person who, who would have loved to have the freedom to be an unencumbered Irish woman. Unencumbered, I mean, by ideology, by history, by, by yeah. culture of the kind, by our university training, by her position by her feminist, this huge neon sign over her head that says feminist. Yeah. Uh, she would have loved to be able to say, you know, as I've seen lots of those writers do, you know, they just love to be able to go back and say, you know, speak as if they were nuns or speak as if they were parish priests, you know, uh, without any angles to that. And um, I, I, I find that fascinating. You know, she was very like that anyway, in, in lots of ways, you know. I remember actually, when I started to write about the famine back in the mid nineties uh, and I was talking to lots of people who kind of had gone into this and uh, a couple of people were talking to me about the way that the body remembers. Mm. And I found this fascinating, you know, that, that not alone that is it possible for my body to remember, but that mm. my body can inherit memories yeah. from my parents and yeah. which, who have inherited. So there that I opened up the possibility there for myself that, it was possible that we had at some level in our, in our, um, uh, in our beings, uh, a memory. Mm -hmm. of and I was writing about this and, and she came up to me in the newsroom and she said, that's absolute nonsense. You see, like she just was completely, uh, yeah. as she could be, like as nobody could be like her. And then about a year, about 12 years, 13 years later, she actually got very friendly with a guy who was involved in the, uh, Stokes uh, Famine Museum, you know, and, and she used yeah. to go down there a lot, you know. Yeah. And she was writing the exact same stuff as I'd been writing 10 years yeah. or so before, you know. So she was like, which is not a criticism of her at all. It shows that she was actually open. 
she could, and that was a great gift as a writer that she could change and grow in all kinds of directions. And and because that's in a way when you actually, if you have a relationship with a writer, I mean a, a reader's a reading relationship with a writer, what you want above them above all is truthfulness. Mm-hmm. And therefore, when they are shocked or changed by something, that they tell you about it. That's mm-hmm. that's the they, you know there's not there's no value in being a writer. There's no point in being a writer if you're not like that. Yeah. You know. Uh, if you're just going to have the same view that you started, that you left college with, and just regurgitate that, and I won't name any names, but you know, uh, uh, you know, you just go on for forty years saying the same things. Well, I mean, what's the virtue in that for, uh, for the reader, except to be affirmed? And that's a different function. That's not writing, really. That's mm-hmm. the same kind. I don't know what that is, really. You know, um, you know, it's 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 just uh, affirmation of your own prejudices as much as anything your perceptions at least anyway so uh yeah that 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 is you see that's the core of the thing then that that happened uh in the in the 60s that that uh, we were in a sense invited to vacate our own natures mm-hmm. uh, you know and uh, in, and in return we were given this thing called freedom ultimately mm-hmm. yeah. freedom. Um, and this diminished form of freedom that really amounted to consumer choices uh, rather than, uh, I don't know, so the, the, the freedom to choose uh, the good over the uh, yeah, and also over consumer goods. The full, and also the full kind of, you know, uh, exhaustion of our, of our appetites, mm-hmm. you know, uh, physically, sexually, all those. That, that was defined as freedom. Mm-hmm. And this is the paradox of, of one of the par- many paradoxes of being human is that all of those promises that are inherent in those instincts are never f- perfectly realized. Yeah. And the more that you chase them, the, the dimmer they get. Yes. Yeah. So the, what, what one learns as one grows older in, in, as a human being is that actually the, 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 the equilibrium of the person is achieved by simply moving through those desires. Yeah. And not seeking them. I mean, I, I think of uh, Arthur Miller, the playwright. He he had a, a a placard, a card in front of him as he wrote all the time, yeah. and it, it had one word on it, and the word was forego. <laughs> yeah. So that it was to forego the temptation to realize, to resolve the plot, to to mm-hmm. close down the narrative, to to finish the play. Right. So right. this the, the the trick of the playwright was to continue the suspense. As long as possible until it became exhausting for everybody. Yeah. And in a sense, we could all of us have that card in front of us as human beings, forego, because in foregoing the, the desire to, 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 to satisfy ourselves, to appease ourselves, to, to gratify ourselves, that is where being the, the, the life of the human is. It is moving towards the next possibility, moving through life, you know, and understanding that there's something else. And if that, then that, of course, immediately becomes a religious idea, because where are you going? Well, you're moving towards the horizon. Mm-hmm. And that is the dynamic. I'm not saying that that's a rule. I'm not saying that that's the law of the church or of God. Right? I'm saying that's the nature of man and woman. And so when you actually pursue that line, you, 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 towards the horizon, you, f- you feel peaceful. Mm-hmm. You know, your life is suddenly meaningful. I don't know why. Uh, but it is. You think, oh no, this is. I feel okay. I, yeah. You know, that's why when we're out walking, you know, I think we feel good, even if we have a lot of stress in our lives. If you go for a walk, at a certain point, you walk, you kind of therapeutically shake off a lot of the stress that you've been feeling, and and you feel, oh, it's okay. I have perspective. I have balance. I have, a, you know, understanding of things at a deeper level. Um, so I think that, that that's kind of the, the trick that the 60s played on us, that it, it took away that card that we would have had in front of us with that word forego on it. And suddenly, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, a, a, you know, um, what is that thing, that Alistair Crowley line, which is, you know, do what thy wilt shall be the whole of the law. Yeah. yeah. And, and that has been the great disaster for the human species. Uh, mm. in, the last, in the second half of the, sec- the 20th century and into the 21st, it has it got, it has just gone, uh, you know, absolutely viral, to put it like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think I agree with nearly everything you just said there. 
Uh, and yet, I, one of the things that I find interesting uh, about your particular response to these circumstances is that you have, I, as far as I know, uh, kind of gone back to the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church kind of, you know, it, every, when I was growing up in the 80s and, and, and the 70s, um, everybody went to Mass every Sunday. And it was a significant act of rebellion not to go to Mass. And then that the whole thing fell apart extraordinarily quickly. And there were all these revelations about things that had gone on in uh, in Catholic-run institutions around the country. And there, there's now a huge amount of anger still against the Catholic Church in Ireland. And it really seems to be um, just very diminished and, and almost without hope for the future. And I, I wonder why you felt that you wanted to go back into Catholicism as a response to the shallowness of liberal culture rather than looking for some... Well, uh, solution. I have to give a very long, complicated answer to that because it's yeah. not true that you know it's not entirely the full truth that I've gone back. Yeah. In the sense that uh, sometimes I'm I, I'm more aware of the deficiencies of, for example, Irish Catholicism. Mm -hmm. I say that many of the critics, people on the outside, you know, I, I think yeah. calling pretty much, you know, I, I, it's really shockingly bad. Um. So it's not that. I mean, and and you know, I I very often don't have any inclination to go to mass mm. uh, at all um, mm. because I know what will awake me there that I will come out feeling reduced as mm -hmm. opposed to exalted and yeah. uplifted and, um, but uh, there's something else about Catholicism. Catholicism uh, the attraction for me is that Catholicism is as it were the, 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 the storehouse mm. of, the wisdom of the ages more than anything else I mean you know there's no bank, no library in the world that you could say uh, is equally, you know, uh, has, has retained the sense of what the history of the human person has been mm. uh, metaphysically, physically, psychologically, spiritually, all of those categories which are kind of now kind of being pushed to the margins of our, mm. of our culture. And I find that profoundly interesting. And I find people in, in like, you know, like Ratzinger, for example, just to give one example, uh, really incredible people. I mean, intellectually, I think he, you know, uh, he was amazing and is amazing. Um, I think it was a mistake for him to become Pope uh, because then he presided over this deeply uh, rickety and corrupt organization. Uh, mm. That's a real problem you know, for him now as, in, you know, I mean, he's continued to write and so on. If he had remained a theologian, I, I think it would have been probably better. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of defined, that thought defines my own sense of, of what this is about. I suppose, I mean, I came to back to this through Alcoholics Anonymous and to the idea of God as I understand him. Mm -hmm. And it, there is a kind of a principle in, in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, which I fought for a long time, which is that you will eventually, more than likely, return to the the faith of your youth yeah um and i can i can understand now why that they would say that because that's where you've learned that's where you have bought your furniture as it were yeah. for your spiritual being and, and and you know it's still there and it's you know it's it's a bit dusty and needs a bit of a lick of paint or whatever but you, that's kind of when you start becoming interested in it again and resuscitating this dimension of yourself it's natural that you would go back to that place and, and I did that uh, and sometimes it was good and sometimes it was very bad mm -hmm. and at the moment it's pretty dismal mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know I know people who have left the church I mean uh, I was speaking recently to Rod Dreher who wrote the, the Benedict Option um, there a couple of years ago and he, he's become a, a Russian Orthodox or something you know okay. yeah. I find that in a strange way, tempting, but also weird, you know, I, 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 um, because I'm not Russian, I'm not very orthodox. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, I kind of know why you would want to make a gesture like that sometimes when I hear the gibberish coming out of the mouths of bishops and priests. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, so I don't have any, you see, there's another level to this thing. You see, people say to me, well, you know, you know, I can. I don't need a church for my spiritual welfare, for my spiritual development. I can look into myself. I can become a Buddhist. I can whatever, and that's all very true. 
And I'm very interested in that as well. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm interested in, say, someone like Michael Hardy's journey. Like, you know, he's really mm. Yeah. And uh, I, I like Michael. And, uh, you know, uh, he's an interesting guy. I mean, we don't agree about everything, but like, that's what everybody says to me. You know, well, I don't agree with everything you say. Yeah. As if, you know, there's, that would be expected that you would agree with everything I say. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, I, there is another dimension, which is, we have to take responsibility for the cultural transmission of the ideas that have allowed us to breathe. Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't take an interest in how that is done, then you, you, you know, I, I think that's a, a, you know, it's a bit like paying your taxes or something, you know? Yeah. Okay. If I opt out and just become a Buddhist, I can do that and, and have a spiritual life. But what, what am I giving back to replicate what I was able to save my life? Yeah. You know, what am I giving to that? Yeah. Uh, that's the question and, and uh, so that's the stro I think that you know there's a different question then I mean that it's, it's not just that I am a Christian uh, interested in my own salvation I'm interested in um, the survival of Christendom mm. not because it is an institution uh, worth saving uh, not because uh, you know it was it, it is you know by definition the one true church maybe mm. it is I don't know if that's necessarily a helpful way of looking at things anyway. Mm. But it's because a Christendom is the basis, it's the bedrock of our civilization, of, our, mm. of what has allowed us to function at all and yeah. not become savages yeah. again. And, and, you know, these are big things, you know. And, and so it's at that level. But it is, I agree, it's, it's deeply unsatisfactory, I mean. But probably not, in my mind, for the same reasons that other people might regard as unsatisfactory. I mean... You know, and I would put, if I would start describing the chaos of the church, mm. I'd probably describe it quite differently to most of the people who read the Irish Times, for example. Mm. I guarantee you I would, because they would have a different impression entirely of what's happened. Yeah. I happen to know what's happened. Uh, yeah. And they won't read it in the Irish Times. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm very aware of how bad things are. And I do think it is possible that the church could disintegrate completely mm. um, culturally. But I think it will always have the possibility of recovery in some way. But it could be very small when it does. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but I suppose against that is the question of human beings and whether this is, you know, it's either true or it's not. And I don't mean that with, that it's God is, exists or not. That's a different question. But the human being is either something like we've been talking about, or he, he or she is not. Yeah. And if, if not, then, well, then evolution will take care of everything and will either yeah. remove us from the stage or will change us so that we can continue to survive, to, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to exist. Yeah. But if we are like this, then we can't just jettison these cultural uh, uh, instruments that have enabled us to survive as we are and to build the civilization that we have built. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's in serious doubt now for all kinds of reasons. I mean, Europe is the heart of, the, of Christian civilization and yeah. Europe is in serious danger of absolute extinction. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've talked about a lot of different things here. Perhaps I could ask you as a closing question what you plan to write or do in the next few years? Well, uh, I, all of my life I've, I've wanted to be a, a fiction writer because mm. um, I'm fascinated by fiction and I'm fascinated by, you know, when a great writer um, writes a book that lives in history because it managed to capture the essence of a time and a place. Mm. You know, the Russians did that and Joyce did that and Beckett did that, Kafka. Mm -hmm. uh, these are, you know, I, I, so, but all of my working life, I keep getting waylaid from concentrating on that. I mean, back in the early 90s, I wanted to give up journalism and start, writing, and I started writing plays, and I had some plays put on, and I was moderately successful at that. And then life took over. I started to, you know, my daughter came along, and I started to write more about that, and was yeah. drawn, I was drawn into journalism, per se. And now I, I, 
I hesitate to say this, that I won't be waylaid again, because there are so many things that I could be waylaid into. But I would like to go back to writing, to trying to write fiction. Um, maybe, maybe a novel eventually. Uh, I have draft. I have tried it, and, and, and uh, yeah, something there. There's something there, a draft of some kind there. But I, I'm particularly at the moment interested in short stories, and and in the idea that actually short stories in this era of the short attention span is probably a medium that is probably coming back into its own. Mm. And that there are ways of dealing with the short story that are, you know, uh, um, this struck me reading a book by, um, what was the name of it? It was a book called the George Saunders, uh, called The Tenth of December. And, and what struck me about that book was, it's a book of short stories. I think there are about 12 stories. And when you read it, all the stories are like different stories, obviously, different characters, different uh, places, different times. But there's a, a kind of a music of continuity that you feel in the stories. And then so that when you've read the book, it's actually like, if you read it in sequence, this is my experience of it. It is like you've read a novel. Mm. Emotionally, you've read a, lo a novel. Mm. Consciously, you've read short stories. Mm. I'm interested in that idea. Because I think it may have actually something to do with this moment we're at, you know, that, that, that we talked about earlier, going back to that question of the attention span on the internet and yeah. Yeah. Nicholas Carr and the shallows and, and all of that. And I, I'm, I'm interested in that. I would love to have the time to just go and be that kind of writer for a couple of years and see what would happen. Uh, yeah. But every time I try to do it, somebody, my phone rings and, and I suddenly find myself in some yeah. other a mess, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, so um, I mean, there, there are times when I, I am so in despair about the state of my country that um, it's very tempting to just jack it all in and go somewhere and just forget about it and say, because nothing I can do, you know, and, yeah. and uh, um, like my, my current book is in a certain sense a little bit like that, what I just described, but it's a non-fiction book, obviously. It's a story mm -hmm. of my, my um, recent travails, but it's told in a particular way, in a context, in the context of Ireland, as I remember it, as I grew up in it, and, and uh, how, as, I, uh, um, as I came to, to reason and to, to, to understand all of these things. So it's an attempt. I, and, and, so this book I, I, that I, you mentioned there, Give Us Back the Bad Roads, is called, which is like, mm. I suppose, an invocation of an Ireland that is now disparaged and almost gone. You know, yeah. so when we were growing up, like all the roads were, we said, it was actually a thing, you know, uh, the bad roads, you know, yeah. very bad roads down there, you know. And, but there was a great joy in being in those places where there was bad roads. Yeah. And I mean, I have that feeling now, if I go back down the West Side, uh, you know, there's a back road I can go, you know, which yeah. is no motorways, there's no dual yeah. carriage. It's from Mullingar through to, Lot, to Lanesborough, through Ballymahan, and it's a very narrow road. And when I go down there, it's like it's Proustian. You know, I can feel I'm back in 1978 or in 1982. Mm -hmm. And I'm to, to Dublin to go and see Roxy Music in the RDS. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so... So in a sense, this is my question, like, do I have to, uh, do I, uh, uh, you know, do I have to become a fiction writer to achieve something that I think, see, I'm kind of haunted by that idea, I think, that I'm not really, I have not really been a proper writer, mm -hmm. that I've been distracted into, into uh, a form that is, uh, you know, of itself incapable of longevity. Yeah. You know, and that it will not be around. The people in the future will not be able to gain from my work any sense, particularly of the time, because I'm using references that are too particular mm. to the time and the place. Mm. That's the nature of what yeah. you know, nonfiction. That's what happens. I'm interested in that idea. Uh, I'm not sure that is necessarily the case. I mean, uh, I think one or two of my books will will survive in that sense. You know, I think driving at the crossroads, even though I, I regard it as a a flawed book in lots of ways. People, an awful lot of people read it, an awful lot of people bought it. And, and it's a, that was my first book. And, you know, it, it really shocked me that it became a book at all or that, it, you know, that, that people actually liked it. But people still talk to me about it. And I, can't, I have to honor that, you know. I mean, yeah. I've written lots of books in the dream that nobody knows I've written, you know. And, and yeah. 
Uh, but this one, I, I think it's a little bit like, it's the most like Driving at the Crossroads that I've drawn since. And, um, uh, but of course it's themes and it's, it's, it's characters are very different to the most, you know, by definition, they, they, they would be. So, uh, but I, 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 so I'm not sure. I, 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 uh, uh, I also worry that I'm, I'm 63 now and I, I worry, you know, I mean, that, you know, how long do I have left? I don't mean how long will I live, but how long will my mind remain yeah. capable yeah. Of, of doing yeah. this work at all? I mean, things happen to your mind as you go on. You can see this with writers, you know. Yeah. Uh, some of the greatest writers uh, that I've read, I mean, I've seen them when they hit 70. Mm -hmm. They start to disintegrate, you know, and, and yeah. that's just very sad thing to see. But it would be even sadder to, to, to be at the center of it, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but I, so I, I, I think it's now or never. If I'm going to do this thing with fiction, I think I should be at to be at it pretty soon, and I do intend to start. So this year is my that's my resolve to try and find the time to do that again on a continuous basis. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I look forward to seeing the uh, the results of that. Um, thank you very much for for taking part in this. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you.